uh, um, uh, Ali and I didn't plan our uh, talks together, but they really mesh well together because I think that we come at it from exactly the same perspective. A couple of years ago, I was in a classroom just like this, and I made a joke about uh, 1066 and the Magna Carta, and it didn't get a laugh. And uh, so I moved on. But then 30 seconds went by, and there's a little Twitter over here, and then a little Twitter over here, and then someone over here said, good joke. And I said, yes, yeah, so like, the, like the joke was immediate. Why, why 30 seconds later? And it was because someone had Googled over here, and someone had wikipedia over here, and then they posted it on Facebook, and they created a Facebook a link for my class, and so posted it on that. And since all of them were on Facebook, <laughs> then they all got the joke at the same time two minutes later. <laughs> and it was at that point that I realized that the old model of the sage on the stage, of the guardian of knowledge, had gone out the window. That whatever education was, it wasn't me, with my big bowl of secret facts, spooning them into empty vessels, and then waiting for them to vomit them back in some kind of exam. And I said to myself, what's the real point of this education? If, if as Ali points out so well, if Google, if that kind of, if the information is available to everyone, then what's my job? What's my role? It's no longer to monitor the flow of information at all. You guys can Google whatever you want, and you'll get something. My knowledge, my point, my purpose is to turn that information into knowledge so that you can evaluate the information that you get and discover whether or not it's useful, valuable, whether or not the context fit, whether it's translatable, or whether that information has some kind of validity. And so one of the things that I did right then was I changed my courses. And I stopped teaching in the way that I learned. You know, you start off with the theory, and then you go through history, and then you go through the case. Because that's not the way that, you know, like there's no, there's, that doesn't relate to the way that m students get information now. What I did was I started using problem-based learning. And I said, okay, so I've got a big class. It's called Politics and Globalization. And it's about stuff. So I started and I said, okay, we're going to look at problems, uh, everyday problems from your personal daily life, and we're going to unpack them. And we're going to figure out where the global is in your cup of coffee. And it turns out that the cup of coffee is a really great example. It presents us a real problem. It connects international economics with branding and marketing, with your personal consumption habits, with the certification of organic farmers, with a structural adjustment, with the world. It's perfect, as long as we can figure out how to unpack it. So what I did was I you know, did some reading in education journals. And uh, you know, it turns out that students do best when they repeat the task that they've been taught how to do. Uh, that shouldn't be a surprise. That's why exams are so dumb, because we don't teach you to do exams, and then we give you an exam. So I didn't do that. I said, We're, we do case studies. You do a case study. So my case studies, I thought, were awesome. Water, trash, coffee. And then their assignment was to do their own case studies. And what I found was that they were way more inventive than mine. They were doing corn and porn and prayer and all sorts of things that I hadn't considered as either a daily activity <laughs> or as a global activity. And I thought to myself, that's it. I was trapped, even when I liberated myself and went problem-based. I was trapped by the idea that I could select things better than they could. And when I gave them the freedom to choose whatever case they wanted, they came up with great ideas. Now, as Ali said, now, like, uh, th this kind of openness and anarchy still needs some kind of uh, feedback and evaluation. Uh, Robert Frost says that the best thing about poetry is that it is, quote, riding free in harness. You know, like, you can't just say you get to study whatever you want and whatever you say is equally valid. That goes against the exact point of turning information into knowledge. But what we can do is use something called crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is the idea that when you get a large group, the average answer for any question is better repeatedly than the best answer from the best student all the time. 
It's just the law of large numbers. So you say, why don't we use that for education? I couldn't agree with Ali Moore. You put the student at the center and you say, you tell me where we start. You tell me what we look at. And then whether it's coffee or corn, we will do the exact same thing. We will unpack that case study, we will unpack that problem together, and then we'll find out what the global aspects are. And then we're collaborating in learning. Now, because I've already, um, uh, because I've already got the experience about all of the sort of big important bits of globalization, then that means that I can see the connections to the global when they arise. And that way I can help the students make the connections themselves. But my value added as an instructor is not that I know stuff, because everyone can know stuff. My value added is helping make those connections. So this is what we do. What we do is we say, students, you're in charge of the syllabus. Now, uh, now uh, I'm not going to say that this is a smooth process. Because the way that the university constructs syllabi right now is that it's a contract. I tell you exactly what's there, and it's a contract. I tell you what's there and what's going to be evaluated. You do what's there, and if I deviate, then you go and you write a letter to the dean and say, Dr. Salter is surprised learning, and that's terrible. I only want to learn what's on the piece of paper. And I've, caught, I've been caught by this a couple of times myself. The Greek sovereign debt crisis happened, and there's no room in my syllabus. I've got all sorts of things that were important six months ago. And now the sovereign debt crisis comes up. It's perfect for globalization. It's perfect for talking about economics and politics and society and resistance. It's perfect, but I've got no space. So I say, why am I constraining myself like this? So we let it go. And we say, we're going to do 10 case studies, and you're going to tell me what they are. Now, the students then feel, well, let's be frank, terror, <laughs> because they don't know what it means. But all of a sudden, they know that they own the course, that they're doing it. Every course is bespoke. It's tailored to them. And what we do, inshallah, over time, is that we reinforce and support their good decisions and learn from their bad decisions. So let's say that on the third week, everyone says, yes, yes, porn is the most important problem facing globalization right now. We say, OK. So let's take that seriously. What are the academic writings? What are the, uh, you know, like, uh, what are the NGO writings? What are the IGO writings? And let's take this as a project seriously. And then when we find out that one of the um, uh, sources they've used isn't good, then we say, look, this isn't a good source, and this is why. And so in this case, rather than there being successes and failures, there can only be learning opportunities. Because the students, whether they pick a great topic or a crummy topic, a great source or a crummy source, they get the same skill, which is learning how to turn information into knowledge. Uh, what we've found um, in preliminary tests is that this increases ownership. One of the big problems, is particularly with large lecture courses, is that students feel alienated, they're not connected. You do all sorts of things to try and pull them in, but it's always a challenge. If they're in charge of selecting the course material, then they say, this is my course. I chose this topic. I argued for it on the discussion forums. I talked about it in class. That's my topic. And so it increases ownership. It also makes plagiarism and all those other things a lot harder because you don't know what's coming. It also increases their sense of independence because they say, I'm in charge of this course. I know that I need help in all of the sort of ways of connecting this course to the big ideas, but it's me, the professor. I mean, I'm going to take um, uh, the, my cue from both Ali and the first speaker. That the professor has the confidence in me to decide what's important. And then together, we're going to make the connections between those case studies and um, uh, the larger issues. I think that information wants to be free. And I think that the way that we set up education fundamentally steps away from that. And what this does is transform the professor and the student into a less hierarchical relationship and focuses more on the collaborative nature of knowledge production. And so I hope that you will join me in setting our students free. Thank you.